Welcome to Warrior Stories. My name is Susanna Clark. Today is May 11th, 2023, and my guest today is Liz Crotty. Hi, Liz. Hi. I always like to share how I know my guests, and Liz, you and I know one another because for years we have done theater together, and it's been a while because since COVID, not much has happened, but years and years ago, we were in several productions together, and I feel like we immediately connected, not only because we had similar experiences and personalities, but then we were able to connect because both of us had kids with special needs. And so, you know, anytime you meet another mama out in the community who has children with special needs, there's an immediate bond because there's just so much there that you immediately have in common. And it's an experience that you really don't understand unless you've been through it. And so for me, at least when I meet other moms, I immediately feel like, oh my gosh, we're friends already. And we don't even know each other yet. It's so true. It's that, it's that immediate connection. And I think I particularly glommed onto you because we were so much at the beginning of our journey with the girls at that time and trying to figure out their disabilities. Like we knew there was stuff going on, but you know, we were still and. And here you were this mom who was already like in the trenches doing the things. And so I I loved hearing your perspective on everything. And honestly, you were probably the first parent peer I know who was going through that journey and kind of helped me get started. Well, that's good to know. I didn't know all of that. And I look at you now and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at all the amazing work that Liz is doing. And so it is kind of funny to look back and think about when we first started getting to know each other, because you're right, you were a new mom and you didn't know yet back Mm -hmm. then that you would have kids that had differing abilities is sometimes I like to call it, right? (laughs) Yes. You have come so far. You have contributed so much to your community at this point. And I'm really excited to have you share your wisdom with us because I think you have some perspective that comes from your experiences that I don't have because my experiences are different than yours. So, yeah. And you really have already made a big difference. And so I'm really excited for you to share everything with us today. As we just mentioned, you have children with special needs, but I think something that's unique about you, Liz, is that all three of your children have IEPs. And I, I can't say that, you know, I have three children. One of my children has an IEP and all three of your children have different needs. It's not like you were lucky enough to have three kids that had the same needs, you know, that needed IEPs. You have very different experiences with each one of your kids. So I'm hoping that you will tell us about Blair, tell us about Cora, tell us about Reed and just take us on a journey through their various diagnoses and their educational needs. Sure, absolutely. It's, um, you know, I mean, all kids are different and all kids have different strengths and weaknesses, re- regardless of whether it's a disability. So, you know, it's always fun no matter what, but it's been a little interesting having all three kids with IEPs that really each IEP is very, very unique. My oldest daughter, Blair, she's 11. We knew pretty early on that she had um, a muscle disorder. It took a while to get the official diagnosis, but some things like that were clear. What wasn't quite as clear with her was that in addition to that, she also had ADHD and some learning differences that, you know, kind of took a while to pop up, but we started seeing around kindergarten and saw them sort of, you know, get more significant as she um, approached second grade, which of course, you know, that for her, the timing of that was COVID. (laughs) So that kind of put a wrench in things, but we, we started to get the process going when she was in third grade to get her IEP. She'd had a 504 for the muscle disorder. So we got to experience what a 504 was like, and then moved into having an IEP. And even with the IEP, it was a, a bit of an evolving situation because at first it just addressed the ADHD concerns mm-hmm. later on I had to push and and get the the um the reading deficits addressed and the spelling and and those kinds of things but you know just getting your foot in the door with getting that IEP then opened up a whole lot of options for addressing the full situation and making sure that she was getting all the help that she needed. My other daughter, my middle child is Cora. She is nine years old now. And 
she has a diagnosis of fragile X syndrome, autism, anxiety, ADHD. There's a lot of, and also has a muscle disorder on top of it. She's got a list of maybe 10 different diagnoses, uh, <laughs> which, you know, presents its own challenges, but they all result from her having a deletion of 17 genes on her X chromosome. It took us a very long time to get that diagnosis, but we learned a lot along the way and met with a lot of different specialists. It was quite clear that she needed to be identified early on. We started her out in all the, the PT and the OT, and then um, had her evaluated by Child Find, where she was found eligible for the preschool program. So she had an IEP pretty much right from the get-go. But even with that, it's because her she has so many different challenges in how she learns and how she you know, interacts with the world. Um, it's taken us a really long time to figure out, well, what does her IEP need to look like? What is the best way to deliver the services? You know, it's not even about having the right services in place. It's really about having the right educators who can approach her learning style and really understand, you know, how to get the best out of her. Right. So, you know, now we're in a, in a really good place with her where we have a team that really seems to get her, which is so exciting. Yes. Right. And it's so rare. It's that that's not an automatic, you know, you don't automatically get the right team in your local school or even within your school district. And so when you find that, oh my gosh, it is, it is just, it is gold. And some of it happens accidentally, right? Like this year, her special education teacher, um, her case manager, quit after two months. Another teacher at the school who's a first-year teacher in the autism program was like, hey, I'm happy to take her on on my caseload and work with her. And oh my gosh, it's it's been the most incredible thing. She's able to connect with her in ways that we just really hadn't been able to get. Beautiful. I love that. It's wonderful. And then my youngest is Reed, who is four years old. I really didn't think we were going to end up with an IEP. I'm going to be honest. Because who does that happen to? Three kids in a row, right? Well, I was like, here we go. Like he's, you know, he was hitting like those gross motor milestones. But the thing was like, we were going through COVID when he was very little and I was very distracted by trying to... Oh get Cora her needs taken care of and Blair's needs taken care of and you know so probably my attention fell off of him a little bit during that time and you know started to not notice that he wasn't quite meeting the milestones that he needed to be meeting and when we put him in preschool after COVID was more or less over his teacher came to me and said hey have you heard of child find Oh my gosh. <laughs> have I heard of child find? <laughs> yes. I have heard of child find. I can drive there in my sleep. <laughs> right. right. Oh my gosh. He's got a developmental delay in some areas. There were some speech concerns. There was some behavioral stuff that mom just liked to chalk up to him being a little bit stubborn, right. which comes by maybe perhaps naturally. I mean, right. You know, he started out in the preschool program this year as well at the school. And honestly, it's it's been a little nice because it's one year where I've got all three kids at the same school. <laughs> yeah, which is actually really great. So you are literally a warrior mama. I mean, having to man this is a full-time job that you have having to manage three IEPs for your children. That's a yeah. lot. I was actually looking at it and I have been working on my kids' IEPs straight for over, like, I think it's been six months now of this school year. We've been, you know, amending IEPs. We've been doing annual IEPs and it's literally straight where we're getting close to done <laughs> with wow. the last one. And then, you know, I'm sure it'll just all start again. again. It is, it's so much work. And when I think about how much work my daughter's IEP is, when I, when I think about having to triple that, I just, Liz, I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And 
when I stopped working full time, like I, I knew that I had to do it because I was running two kids to different therapies and my husband and I were trying to share in that and we were both not doing well with our jobs. So like it came down to like, well, someone is going to have to, you I know, well at their job. Exactly. So, you know, I ended up staying home and I don't think I realized at the time, like how much of a job this really was going to become, you know, and, and I'm so glad that I made that decision when I did, because it's helped me have the time to educate myself and to understand the process and, you know, really spend time thinking and researching so that I can go into my meetings and, you know, advocate for my kids in the best way that I can. Because for so many of us, when we first start out on this journey, you know, I had never heard of an IEP. I, you know, somebody mentioned it to me and I, I was like, a what, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's where you start out when you don't live your life as part of this world, you literally don't even know what it is. And then all of these years later, uh, just for me, having gone through the self-education, digging in, figuring out what are all the parts and what are my rights and what are my child's rights. And each part of the IEP leads to the next and you build upon it from year to year and the the, um, you know, the present levels have to be really solid so that you can build the appropriate goals against the present levels. And if the goals can't be measurable, then quite frankly, they're crap. Like you have to have goals that can be measurable and where's the data and everything has to be exact. And it's exhausting. <laughs> A lot. Yeah. You know, you think about making an IEP and how it's just one meeting where you're going to show up and talk about it, but there's so much that you need to do before you get into that meeting, you know, starting with, you know, taking a look at what the data is. Like I always schedule a meeting with my admin team to look at the data before we really even start having conversations nice. um, and just to see what, where we are. And then, you know, we start to have more of like the brainstorming sessions where we talk about, well, this is where we are. This is where we want to be like, not all three of my kids' IEPs are as complicated right. as Cora's. You know, right. it's definitely more of a challenge. There's her document is like, at times it's been close to a hundred pages. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, there's a lot more that that's going on there, and we have a lot of meetings to to discuss that. But you know, it's so helpful because then we we show up for our IEP meeting, and we we all have like a shared understanding. Right where we are, which rather than the contention, which, because in my work as a special education advocate, there's a lot of meetings that get really contentious very quickly because team members are coming into the meeting without a shared understanding of what the end goal is for a particular child. And when a parent is frustrated, frustrated and emotional, which parents have the right to be emotional, by the way, this is their baby. And then you know, the educators come in feeling like, well, I'm doing everything that I know how to do. And you're telling me I'm not doing it right or whatever. There's so much that can go on in these meetings that, that can very easily create contention. And so when you really put in the leg work and you really work on the strengths of the various team members and bringing everybody's knowledge together, including the parents' knowledge and everything that they've observed at home into these meetings and, and and putting in the legwork so that you're having meetings before the actual IEP meeting in order to figure out all the details, that's when you're able to come into an IEP meeting and everybody's on the same page and you work through the document and you just basically, you're just dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and making sure that everybody feels good. And from there, document gets signed and the kiddo gets what they need, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it, it takes, it just takes a lot of, um, I think, intentional choices on both the part of the parents and the educators to build the document that will create the comprehensive education for the child that that particular child needs, because as it is called, it, IEP means individual education plan. So it has to be individualized. It is for that one student. You can't take 
Sally's IEP and apply it to Johnny. It doesn't work it that way. It has to be individualized to that particular student. And so it does take a lot of work and you can't cut and paste. It just doesn't work that way. And it, it, it's a lot of work and I know how much work I've had to put into my daughter's IEP. And so I just want to acknowledge what a warrior mama you are because that's a lot of work. Three IEPs for all three or an IEP for all three of your kiddos. But you know, the, the nice thing about having the three that I don't think I appreciated at first is how helpful it is to go through the process multiple times, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've learned so much in a very short amount of time because I have gone through so many different processes of seeing like the 504, going through preschool twice, going through related service evaluations many times. It's helpful. It's oh. It really is. I think that's helped me in terms of understanding what I felt like needed to be advocated for more. Because when you just have one kid who's going through the system, you know, you might think, oh, well, this isn't working great for them, but you know, it's probably just me. It's just my kid. Right. But when you have three opportunities of going through it and you start to see commonalities, you're like, no, I, I think no problem it's here. a bigger issue. And that's what led me to joining our SEAC. Right. Um, yeah. I'm going to have you talk about that in a little bit. I can relate to that because with my daughter going through the process for her IEP, everything was new. You know, I didn't know what I was doing and I was just stumbling around in the dark and there was just a lot of guessing, but then eventually it was like, okay, I need answers. So a lot of research and a lot of this I just did on my own. And so now that I work in a space and I'm holding parents' hands as they are going through the IEP process, whether things are already in trouble and I'm helping them untangle the mess, or if they're at the very beginning of the process, just starting out, that's one of the most fulfilling parts of my job is helping them along the way for their child's journey in such a way so that they don't feel as alone as I felt and they don't feel as lost as I felt and they aren't as confused as I was and they aren't stumbling around making the mistakes that I was. I can help the parents understand what their rights are, but also what the school's rights are because you know there are certain things schools can't or are not obligated to offer legally, even though we wish that they were. But we have to honor that, right? But parents also have rights and the students also have rights. And so it's a matter of helping everybody understand what those are. It's just a really satisfying part of my job because I don't ever want anybody to feel as alone as I did. So it's wonderful with you how you may have felt lost at the beginning, but by the time you got to read, you're like, yes, I know what child find is. It's true. And I think that that is one of the most important things that an advocate does do. And I ended up getting advocates as well because I needed help and I needed that education and providing that education to parents. I think it is one of the most important things because it empowers parents. There is such a learning curve. I also, I look back on those first couple of years of meetings that I went to where I was just thankful to have my kid getting services. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that she needed help. And I was the parent that picked up their pen and signed right there in the meeting. And I was like, okay, sounds good. Like, <laughs> you know, and you just, you don't know any better. When I talk to parents as well, I'm always trying to like anything I can give them so that they don't feel quite as clueless as I did. And to help them feel like they are a part of the conversation and that their input really is valued and important because that's probably been one of the hardest lessons for me to learn myself is that my observations, what I see is very often pretty spot on. You know, there were things to do with Cora's condition before we had the diagnosis where I was seeing these very high levels of anxiety where, you know, I had intuition about how she learned best and those things weren't always listen to. And it's only through time where we found out, oh, wait, yes, the hallmark of fragile X syndrome is this very high level of anxiety. And look, she's actually like learning things now. We can see that that it's there. And so the, going through that process has taught me to trust my gut on a lot of these things. I need to be an equal participant. Like I, I can't just rely on the professionals in the room to know everything. And they know a lot, 
And I deeply appreciate their perspectives on things and their expertise, but I'm in the room too, for a reason. And I've got to be in there sharing my thoughts so that I don't kick myself later on that I had this information that I knew and I, I didn't share it. Parents are just as important of a part of the IEP team as anybody else at the table. I kind of think they're a more important part of the IEP team, but, but that's something that parents oftentimes don't understand going into the process. I know I didn't when I, when my daughter was young and I was first going to her IEP meetings, I just assumed that because I was not an educator by profession, or I wasn't an occupational therapist or a speech therapist by profession, that my opinion didn't matter. <laughs> I just thought I was there to say thank you for the services you're offering my child. And like you, you sign the paper because you're just glad she's getting anything, right? Yep. I didn't understand my rights. I didn't understand my role. And it was only when things got to a point where I knew that what was happening for my daughter was not right for my daughter. I had no way of articulating it because I didn't understand why I knew it wasn't right, but I still knew it wasn't right. And so I kind of put a halt on the process. They were frustrated. I was frustrated. I left having no idea what I was going to do. All I knew was that it didn't feel right. And my gut kept saying, this is not right. So then I had to go back. And what I realized was I had done a ton of research on my daughter's very, at the time she just had a charge syndrome diagnosis. I had done so much research on her diagnosis when she was a baby, when she first received it. And it was all from a medical point of view, like the very baseline, like, is she going to live kind of a thing? You know, thankfully, you know, she wasn't as medically fragile as a lot of children with charge syndrome are, but when I started reading about it, it became clear very quickly, you know, a lot of children with charge syndrome, they don't live very long. And so that was like the first place my mind went. So I viewed her, the research that I was doing into charge sy syndrome through a, a medical perspective. What I realized all those years later is that I had never done the same thing through an educational perspective. And so I went to back to the drawing board and I started doing all this research on charge syndrome from an educational point of view, and then I was able to come back to the IEP table and say, okay, this is what I need you to understand about my daughter's situation. And from that research, they were able to do some research, the various team members. And then we were all able to come back to the table and actually agree on an IEP that was right for her. So as parents, like you said, Liz, we have to listen to our gut. We just have to do it. And know that we are just as important of a part of that team as any one of the educators or medical clinicians that are sitting at the table. Absolutely. So I'm hoping that you will explain what twice exceptional means, otherwise known as 2E, and what you have observed about your daughter Blair's academic success in regard to this issue. Because that's a term that I hadn't heard of until maybe two or three years ago. And a lot of people might not have any idea what the term twice exceptional means when it comes to the special education world. So if you'll explain that to us, that would be fantastic. I don't think I was aware of the term until a few years ago, either when it started like creeping up into the things I was reading about. And, you know, as we were going through with Blair and her educational journey, she wasn't doing well in school, right? Like she was clearly having struggles, but when she was out of school, we could see she had this incredible curiosity, this incredible ability to memorize things. Like this kid had memorized in order, like all the presidents of the United States and knew all these different facts about all of them and was so good at like synthesizing information and making those connections. And none of that was showing up at school. You know, she would do her testing and stuff and she'd be in like the 30th percentile for things. Um, you know, just kind of like middling her way through, you know, one of the things that we did that was a mistake that I hope people learn from is, you know, I was told at the time, you don't want to get her tested in school. Like, you know, you want to wait until there's really a, a gap, but otherwise she's, you're just wasting your time. She's not going to get an IEP. And so as a parent, I was like, okay, okay. But I know something's going on. And so we went and did testing privately and spent, you know, thousands of dollars 
<laughs> which we shouldn't have done. But, you know, we didn't have an advocate. We didn't know any better. So, you know, we did that and it revealed to us very interesting things where she had a lot of strengths and then she had a lot of weaknesses. And some of those weaknesses even came into play with how she did on her testing. Like when they would do like that IQ test, the cognitive testing, it's not that she got like a super high score because really all those other weaknesses were coming into play when she had to take that test. What we saw that happened when she got her diagnoses, when she got her IEP, when she started taking some medication is her performance at school just like went through the roof. She was doing exceptionally well. She was scoring well into the mid nineties on, on her test. Like ever it was, I mean, you look at her testing history and it's, it's just clearly like the most incredible success story. This is what happens when you give kids the accommodations and focus on the areas of weakness they were having, which for her, she was, you know, she could read these books, but she was guessing on words all over the place and substituting and missing. And, you know, we got her that OG instruction and all of a sudden she took off. Like she really did. It's incredible to see. I'm so happy for her and right. for what it's done for her self-esteem to understand that like, she's a smart kid. She's got so much going for her. Twice exceptional is tricky because it can look so different. You know, there are clearly some weaknesses that she struggles with, but she's also got these incredible strengths. And so addressing both of those, giving her the opportunity to explore her strengths while supporting her in her weaknesses is what has helped her become a high achiever and helped her understand herself a little bit more and given her that confidence that she really needed. And I think that was a big part of it. Uh, The toll that this all took on her was it really hurt her self-confidence, not understanding what was going on. Right. And from the outside looking in, for those that maybe don't live their lives inside the space and maybe don't understand special education and, and really what it's for, right? Might assume that a student who is in honors classes would never have an IEP, but that is, that is the furthest thing from the truth. There are lots of kids who are in honors classes that are scoring at the highest level compared to their grade level peers who have IEPs. And it's because they do have disabilities, but that doesn't mean that they aren't able to um, be a part of a gifted program because their, their level of understanding, their cognitive ability, their intelligence, according to, you know, the different assessments is at the top of their grade level and sometimes beyond, but Maybe they have autism. Maybe they have a learning disability. You know, they might have dyslexia. There's all kinds of, of issues that a, that a child might have that does not mean that they don't have the ability to excel academically. However, if they don't have the support they need in those areas, they likely won't excel academically. And so that twice exceptional, what that means is basically that they are exceptional in the fact that they need an IEP, they need special education services, they need accommodations, they need modifications, they they need those related services to help them to overcome the particular challenges that they face. But they're also exceptional in that they have a high IQ, they have a high cognitive ability, they they score at the top of their grade on all their testing and and they're very, very intelligent. So they are twice exceptional, right? They have both, they have both needs. And I love that you shared that story because that's a perfect example of how getting the special education services a child needs when they have such high intelligence is so important. It's just so important that we don't overlook those kids and don't think, oh, well, they're they're doing really well. Or maybe they're doing fine, but they could be doing really well if they had those services. So anyway, it's just this unique category that sometimes people don't realize exists. And it's just really important to identify those kids that fall within that category so that they can reach their highest potential. Right. Because I'm sure if we had not, you know, gone through this process and gotten these supports for Blair, she would not be going into middle school 
with a, a full slate of, you know, advanced classes, she would just be in the regular classes and, you know, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But it's not letting her live up to her potential. We need to open these doors for our kids who are able to um, take advantage of that and give them those supports and kind of dispel that myth that just because you have a disability doesn't mean that you can't also be incredibly bright and capable of so much. Absolutely. It's about the individual and what that individual needs. I'm grateful that that was something that applied to your daughter so you could share it with us today because I have run into this in concept, but I don't run into a lot of people whose kids fall into that category. And so it's it's cool to hear those success stories. Okay, so I'm hoping that you will explain to us the importance of inclusion and how issues around inclusion have affected your children's emotional and academic well-being. Sure, yeah, inclusion is a topic super close to my heart. It was something that we saw from the very beginning of our journey with the preschool programs and how we had them here. And there really wasn't any, you know, there was that section of the IEP that talked about, you know, what access will these kids have to their peers? You know, they're typically developing peers. And it said that they would be in the lunchroom and they would attend assemblies together. And even as a new parent who's new on the journey, who didn't know anything, I was like, man, wow, that's, that doesn't sound right. She needs to be around court, needs to be around typical peers. She needs to have that interaction and not live in a a special ed world. She's going to live in the regular world. She, she needs to be around typical kids. And at that point I started asking questions and I was like, well, what can we do? Can we, can they play together at recess? Can they have kids come in to read stories with them? You know, like those reading buddies, like they do at some of the slightly higher grades. And at the time the answer was no, but it always stuck with me. And I saw as as her journey went on, as she got into slightly higher grades, that while she was in inclusive classrooms, which we call cross category, so you have gen ed students and you have kids with IEPs in there, the difficulty was that if you don't adjust the curriculum in a way that she can access it, is she just sitting there? Is she really a part of the class? She has so many difficulties with fine motor, cutting, writing. She can't write. And all these activities in kindergarten and first grade, so many of them centered around that. And she couldn't do anything. So, you know, we had all accommodations out the wazoo, like everything was pre-cut for her. There was a lot of hand over hand, but she wasn't necessarily being included because she wasn't able to interact with the material in a way that she could access it, right? So that started to be something that became of interest to me there too, is, okay, so this is a problem in terms of how do we make sure that even when our kids are being put in an inclusive environment, that they are still able to participate and access the curriculum just as their gen ed peers do. And then I would see that with Blair too, who also required a lot of modifications and needed those kinds of things where she was kind of scared to use her speech to text Mm -hmm. because nobody else was doing it. You know, when you assign an assignment in one way where it has to be done a certain way, or you have worksheets or things like that. It really puts our kids with differing abilities at a disadvantage when they aren't given different ways that they can interact with the material. So for me, whereas at first I kind of thought inclusion was just being around other typically developing peers, and that is so important We learned that it's so much more than just that. And it's putting structures into place, empowering our teachers and helping them understand when we create curriculum, you know, lesson plans, when we create lesson plans, we need to do it with all of our students in mind, not just do things one way. And when we do that, the awesome part about it is that everybody 
gains from that because right. not everybody likes to learn in one particular way, or maybe they do one day, but they don't the next day. And if we give them opportunities to really interact with material and peers in a way that suits their needs and interests, that's how we find success. And that's been what we've found this year with Cora that's been so successful is all of a sudden when we started adjusting her curriculum in ways that worked for her and then her teacher saw what was going on and how they were doing it and started just incorporating it more broadly into the classroom. And then she could engage with her peers and she got excited about learning in a way that we had never seen before. Like, and she's so proud of it too. And, you know, she comes home with her Chromebook and the different videos and things that they've made for her. They've modified how she learns about the continents and how, you know, we remembered what our numbers were and all these kinds of things in a way that she could access it and feel proud of and feel engaged. So to me, that's been really, really important. And I know I'm still like very much at the early grades, but I'm kind of starting to think ahead of what that inclusion is going to look like as she gets into middle school and high school and being able to participate with her peers in activities and events that take place and, you know, what that's going to look like and how do we make sure that that's actually happening. Right. Well, and what I have observed as I've worked with parents is that sometimes there are things that are implemented in a general education classroom that sometimes they have an educational intent. Sometimes it's just a fun, a fun activity, something that's just f a fun tradition that maybe the class has that inadvertently because of one student's need leaves that student out mm -hmm. and how simple it would be to simply shift that activity in such a way so that all students participate in the same way, including the student that has the special need, right? And it doesn't in any way disadvantage any of the other students, but what it does is it allows the student with the need to participate in the same way as everybody else. And sometimes the shifts are really subtle and really simple and really easy. You just have to think ahead and work through it and maybe offer kind of a broader accommodation to the whole class in order to include that one student. But when you do that, it helps that student to thrive in a way that they can't thrive otherwise. And I love when I see educators incorporate those tactics into their classroom in that way, because in no way does it harm the rest of the students. No. It, but it allows that one student or maybe the two or three students that might have a particular challenge, it allows them to participate um, just like everybody else and not feel like they're different all the time because that's hard on a child's self-esteem. It absolutely is. Like, you know, they get pretty early on, they they realize when they're being treated differently and and that they're doing something different than everybody else is doing. And I think one of the most important things I'm understanding is is how much this is not just like a SPED issue, like this is a, a gen ed issue and it's it needs to be a collaboration between your special educators and your general educators mm -hmm. and really working to identify what those kids needs are ahead of time so that there's less of the modification you know, kind of last minute, like, oh, well, she can't cut, she can't write, like, what are we going to do? And more of the, all right, let's, let's think about how we're going to approach things this year. These, these are my students. These are their, these are their needs. You know, let's, let's try to think creatively about how we can make sure that we are reaching everybody, um, you know, and, and then everyone, everyone's going to end up benefiting from it. Absolutely. And I do love what it teaches, typically developing students about including peers that are different than them. Like I, I love how much it teaches children that are just in general education, the value of their friends and classmates that are different than them. Like yeah. they can all learn from each other. And when we set the example as the adults, as the educators and create environments where everybody can be included, the lessons to those 
typically developing students is profound and lasts with them through their lives. So it goes both ways. It's really beneficial all the way around. To value others. And it also teaches them to value themselves when they feel like maybe they're a little different or they're coming up short in some way, but that it's okay. And having that acceptance of yourself and other people is, I just think such a wonderful gift, right? every person and any opportunity we get to model that inclusion and just love of community, right? Like this is our community. These are, these are our people and really showing that welcoming. And it's not just about the inclusion. It's about the true acceptance and love for these people and, you know, valuing them for everything that they are. Absolutely. All right. So The last thing I was hoping that you would share with us, and this is one of those questions where you can share as much or as little as you would like, because I know as change makers in our community, sometimes there are subtleties and nuances that we have to work through in order to make those changes, right? Um, But you recently became the chair of your local SEAC. And I'm hoping that you'll briefly explain what that is. I've talked about it a bit on Warrior Stories in the past and those who don't know what a SEAC is, S-E-A-C, can can do that research, like thorough research online if they really don't know. But I am hoping you'll give us a brief explanation of what, what a SEAC is and what it does and what your role as the chair is. And then I'm hoping that you'll talk to us about some of the work you are engaging in right now to improve your local school district. Sure. So um, a SEAC, which stands for Special Education Advisory Committee, is something that's mandated by the state of Virginia, um, and each school district should have one. It's basically, it's supposed to be mostly a group of parents. It can have other people, but mostly parents or people with disabilities who serve as a voice for those in the school community who have disabilities and receive special education. And for me, it's been an amazing experience because I found our SEAC in the middle of COVID when I was experiencing so much frustration with everything that was going on. And I started tuning into the meetings virtually and watching these presentations and listening to other parents who had similar concerns, share them. The role of a SEAC is to address systemic concerns within the community, not individual, but systemic. It's very hard to know what is a systemic concern when you feel like you're just all by yourself and alone and trying to figure things out on your own. But tuning into the SEAC, all of a sudden I realized, hey, wait a second, there are other people out there, they're having similar issues, or they're having different issues. And, you know, helping me to get a broader perspective on what was going on in our community. And what the SEAC does that I think is so cool is that they collaborate with our school district. Mm -hmm. They officially serve as advisors to the school board to share the perspective of our families. But we also work really collaboratively with our school administration to address concerns that we see in our community. So, you know, there have been a couple of things that have come up this year, and one of which is because, you know, I've gone through the preschool program now twice with my kids, Mm -hmm. and in researching things for my youngest son, Reed, learned that he really should be getting more of these academic skills taught to him. The Virginia Department of Education during COVID kind of came out with these guidelines and standards for milestones that our students should be meeting in all areas, you know, whether it be fine motor, gross motor, behavioral, um, communication, reading, writing, math, like all the areas. And it's up there on the VDOE website And what I saw when I found that document with my advocate was that some of these areas were not being addressed. And I know we historically haven't been addressing them. And when I would ask for goals relating to them, we couldn't do them because that wasn't part of our program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started to have conversations internally, then addressed our SEAC with a public comment, which public comments are very helpful to a SEAC because they do help 
drive our work and identify areas that need to be looked into further. And I shared my concerns about what we were doing in our preschool programs and and how we could be better preparing our kids with disabilities to go into kindergarten because we know they're going to have a lot of challenges. But if there are things that we could be doing with them while we've got them identified nice and early in this prime time to really make a difference for these kids, we need to be doing that. And so we started having conversations as a SEAC with our special education department about our concerns and their responsive to them and are starting a work group to address those things, you know, which is great because we, we have that collaboration that we can continue working off of. And hopefully we'll be able to make some real meaningful change for all of our preschool programs. That's the thing about the work that we do as parents of children with special needs. We work so hard for our kids, but oftentimes by the time the change that we need for our child is made, our child has moved beyond that point. And so the benefit actually goes to those who come after our child. And for me, I think that is one of the most beautiful parts of this community and the way in which us as parents are holding each other up from each year to the next, like a first grade class, or in this case, you know, a preschool situation where, you know, Reed's going to keep getting older and he's going to go through elementary school, but all the kids that come after him are going to benefit from the work that you're doing. And then those parents are going to notice areas of need in other places and they're going to dig in and work and their child might move beyond by the time those changes are made, but every child that comes after, you know, them are going to benefit from that. And I just think that that's, that's the glue that binds all of us together in this community is, is the work that we do oftentimes benefits other people more than it ends up benefiting our own children. But we still do it because we, because we have been benefited. You know, when my daughter first started in, in her educational process, I was very aware that 10, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, my baby probably wouldn't have even been in my own home. I probably would have been advised to place her in a state-run institution. So, I mean, it's the decades. And really, when you go way back in the history of disability in America, it's over a century of work that has gotten us to the place that we're at now. And and I was keenly aware of that when my daughter was young, because I knew enough about that history because I grew up with a cousin who had significant challenges and I saw what his mom had gone through when I was a child. So when I had a daughter that was diagnosed with such significant needs and disabilities, I was aware of that history enough to just be so profoundly grateful that she had what she had. But then as she went through the process and I was able to see, "Mm, there's a problem here, there's a problem there. And I realized, you know, the work is not done. I don't know if it'll ever be done. And as parents, as we see problems, if we dig in and do that work to change things, sometimes it doesn't benefit our kids but it will benefit everybody that comes after them. And so it's so worth it and so needed and so important for us to continue to support one another in this way so that our kids get what they need. So I think it's wonderful that you have stepped up to the plate and that you're, you know, have agreed to be the chair of your SEAC because that's a lot of work. It's a big responsibility, especially for a county as large as yours with a school division that's as large as yours. That's a big job. And there's a lot of people relying on you and a lot of things that you're going to have to get done. And you still have your three kiddos with their IEPs. So there's so much that you have on your plate. And I just think that the work that you're doing is so important and it's just making such a huge difference to your community. And I think it's awesome. Well, you know, and as much as in this example with the preschool, it's going to be helping out other families, but in my role in SEAC and the work that we do in SEAC, I'm also helping future Liz as well, because I'm starting to learn from other parents about the challenges that are coming in middle school and high school. And we're all working together to try to address those challenges as well. So that my kids might not have to go through what their kids went through. We're so lucky to have people on all sides of us that are supporting us and that are helping us get to the next level and the next place with our kids. And so, you know, I'm just very grateful to be part of a community 
where we have all those different perspectives of the people who've gone through the the tough times but are still in it to work and to make things better for those after them. And I've had that same experience with the work that I do because, you know, my daughter's in sixth grade, but as I have worked with and advocated on behalf of families whose children are in high school, I'm learning so much from what they're, the challenges their children are facing. I can help them with that IEP. I can help them with that transition plan. I can pull together the resources. I can do that work for them, but as a professional, not as a parent who has been through it yet with my own daughter. And so everything that I'm learning from what they are going through is going to benefit my daughter also. And so it's exactly like you said, you know, we are all helping each other out. And I just think it's the most beautiful community. When I started on this journey, somebody said to me way back when my daughter was first being diagnosed and I was so overwhelmed and just scared to death. And I had no idea like how I was going to be the mother of a child with significant disabilities. This woman said to me, and I think she was a, I believe she was a speech therapist back in California where we used to live when my daughter was young, but she said to me, you are going to meet the most amazing people on this journey. And it's true. I have met the most amazing people on this journey and the community that we are able to be a part of. It is so, so hard, but this community is so beautiful and I'm so profoundly grateful to be a part of it. And I love, like, we'll go back to where we started at the beginning of this conversation. I love when I'm involved in some other community event and I randomly meet a fellow warrior mama and we get to connect on this level and kind of track what the other person has been doing all of these years and keep learning from each other. And that bond, even though we hadn't spoken in a long time, as soon as we connected the other day, it was like no time at all had passed, right? I know it's true. It was amazing getting to talk to you and connect again. And I hope we get to continue having this connection because we really were, we're on such similar different journeys, but we all have so much to learn from each other and we're just so much stronger when we band together and really collaborate with each other and collaborate with the people who care with, about our community, because there's a lot of those people too, who just out of the goodness of their heart, they want to be out there fighting right along with us, which is really incredible. It is. It is beautiful. Well, Liz, thank you so much for coming on Warrior Stories and sharing your experiences and your wisdom and your perspective. And like you said, I hope that we just keep keeping in touch with one another and keeping track of what the, you know, the work that the other one is doing. And we live close enough. We need to just get together for lunch one of these days. Cause it's going to happen. Maybe this summer we can, we'll make it. Yes, definitely. Let's do it. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks Liz. Of course. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye.